On the 24th of May, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 rocket filled with 60 satellites into space. This marked the beginning of their ambitious new project called Starlink, which aims to provide high quality broadband internet to the most isolated parts of the planet, while also providing low latency connectivity to already well connected cities. SpaceX aimed to make their broadband as accessible as possible, claiming that anyone will be able to connect to their network if they buy the pizza box sized antenna which SpaceX is developing themselves. This launch of 60 satellites was just the first of many. SpaceX has 12,000 satellites planned for launch over the next decade. SpaceX kept pretty quiet about what was next for the Starlink project until November 2018 when SpaceX received approval from the FCC to deploy 7,500 satellites into orbit, on top of the 4,400 that were already approved. On May 24th, the first batch of production satellites were launched into orbit and people around the world quickly started to spot the train of satellites moving across the night sky. This launch is a sign of things to come. While this initial group of satellites are not fully functional, they will be used to test things like the Earth communication systems and the Krypton thrusters, which will be used to autonomously avoid debris and deorbit the spacecraft once it has reached the end of its life cycle. This ion thruster will initially be used to raise the Starlink satellites from their release orbits of 440 kilometers to their final orbital height of 550 kilometers. They will also be used in conjunction with the onboard control momentum gyroscopes located here and the US government's space debris collision prediction system to allow the satellites to adjust their orbits to dodge collisions, which we have also spoken about in more detail in a previous video. When the satellites have reached the end of their service life, they can then use the same attitude controls and thrusters to deorbit the satellite. SpaceX have included all the necessary hardware to minimize space debris risk. In their Federal Communications Commission approval application, they claim that 95% of the satellite will burn up on re-entry, with only the ion thruster internal structure and silicon carbide components standing a chance of survival. Those silicon carbide components are likely to survive as they are essential materials for the operation of lasers and thus have an extremely high melting point of 2750 degrees. Which brings us to our communications abilities, the primary function of the satellite. SpaceX have been tight-lipped on many of the details of the satellite, but thanks to the FCC filing, we know that the satellites will contain five 1.5 kilogram silicon carbide components, which indicates that each satellite will contain five individual lasers. These lasers, like our fiber optic cables here on Earth, will use light pulses to transmit information between satellites. Transmitting with light in space offers one massive advantage over transmitting with light here on Earth, however. The speed of light is not constant in every material. In fact, light travels 47% slower in glass than in a vacuum. This offers Starlink one huge advantage that will likely be its primary money maker. It provides the potential for lower latency information over long distance. Each individual Starlink satellite has four phased array antenna located here, 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 and here. This directional beam was an essential part of SpaceX's FCC approval application, as thousands of satellites broadcasting undirected radio waves would cause significant amounts of interference with other communication methods. Once that data is received by one Starlink satellite, it can begin to transmit that information between satellites using lasers. Each time we hop from satellites, there will be a small delay as the laser light is converted to an electric signal and back again, but it is too minuscule to consider. Things get tricky here with using lasers, as we need to accurately hit the receiver on neighboring satellites to transmit that data. Let's look at SpaceX's proposed constellation to see how this will work. SpaceX's first phase of 1,584 satellites will occupy 24 orbital planes, with 66 satellites in each plane inclined at 53 degrees. This will look something like this. Communications between neighboring satellites in the same orbital plane is relatively simple, as these satellites will remain in relatively stable positions in relation to each other. This gives us a solid line of communication along a single orbital plane, but in many cases, a single orbital plane will not connect two locations. So we need to be able to transfer information between these planes too. This requires precise tracking, 
as the satellites traveling in neighboring orbital planes are traveling incredibly quickly and will come in and out of view. This means the Starlink satellite will need to switch to a new satellite in the network. This can take time. The best figure I could find is about a minute. For Starlink may be faster, but it won't be instantaneous, and thus it has five optical communication systems on board to maintain a steady connection to four satellites at all times. Users will connect to this internet using a Starlink terminal, which will cost around $200 each. This will still be far outside the purchasing power of many third world citizens, but it's a start, and vastly cheaper than similar currently available receivers like the Kymeta version at a price of $30,000. Elon Musk says that these will be flat enough to fit onto the roof of a car and other vehicles like ships and aeroplanes. This will allow Starlink to compete with traditional internet providers.